I'm Dominic Marino. I'm a veterinary surgeon and uh, I specifically focus my work in, in the area of, of neurosurgery. This is Zoe. Um, she's going to be four in October. I've been a veterinary surgeon for almost 20 years. Well, at first they said that she had a skin condition, so we took the medication for that and then we noticed she couldn't sleep and she started to be able be unable to put her head down and this would mostly happen at night so we took her to about two or three different emergency rooms for um, veterinarianism and it was just basically they told us that she was adjusting to me being pregnant. So we started searching online for different disorders with the Cavalier King Charles dog and we were looking for specifically scratching disorders and we came across the website in our searches and found the information on Chiari malformations and read it and it fit the symptoms and this happens to be a place that does a surgery so we brought her here for um, a checkup. They took a look at Zoe and basically took her into the back and did a quick exam and brought her back and thought they were pretty sure that that she did have a Chiari malformation. So patients that come here typically are sick and they're sick to a level where their family vet thought that they would benefit from specialist care. Now the diagnosis of Chiari malformation is a, is a bit difficult. And besides the fact that our patients can't speak to us, we have to interpret the wide variety of signs these patients come in with. So most often they come in with scratching or itching, signs you typically would attribute to an allergy. It's not unusual for Chiari patients to be referred to us from an allergist that has a patient that's not responding to traditional allergy medication. Uh, the other large population of dogs come in for neck pain. Sadly, intense neck pain, screaming, rolling in pain. It could be intermittent or it could be persistent. So this is a model of a skull of a dog, typical patient we might operate. And this is the back part of the skull called the occipital region. And this is the area that's problematic in Chiari patients. So this area of the skull protects the part of the brain called the cerebellum. And when it's malformed, there may be an indentation putting pressure on the cerebellum. This is the area that we find abnormal in dogs with Chiari malformation. The goal with surgery is to provide decompression or to take the pressure off the back of the brain, allowing the fluid to flow more normally. 25% of patients that have a successful decompression will suffer from scar tissue. That's using the traditional technique called decompression. Those results are similar to the results seen in human patients. After that surgery, we perform a cranioplasty. Cranioplasty is when we apply titanium mesh over the back of the skull and we supply some bone cement to protect the brain. This procedure has decreased the scar tissue rate quite dramatically. One of the things we've learned is that most of the signs we see in our patients are attributable to the syrinx rather than the direct compression of the cerebellum. So there's really two things we have to be looking at and the best way to examine a patient medically speaking, to get a definitive diagnosis is an MRI. As the central canal of the spinal cord, which normally contains a small amount of fluid, starts to dilate and forms a syrinx, that, that stretching of the fibers seems to cause nerve pain or irritation. It's like phantom pain, and these pets feel like they have a burning sensation and they want to scratch and itch. One of the reasons why pets don't do well after surgery is a medical term called comorbid disease, meaning something else is going on too. In veterinary medicine, because finances are borne by the owner, it becomes difficult to pursue every avenue. So a pet that doesn't do well after surgery sometimes has something else going on. We've been fortunate that we've been able to help owners repeat MRIs to see. We call it our doctor report card. And we re-X-ray re and re-MRI every patient six months after surgery to see how we did. Dr. Marino suggested once we found out that Zoe was diagnosed with a Chiari malformation that we tried medication first. Uh, we did try the prednisone and also the gabapentin and for a little bit it actually did work and her symptoms did subside but eventually when the prednisone was tapered off she brought back all of her symptoms which then he thought for sure that she needed the surgery. I do know about um, Chiari malformations and syringomyelia in humans. I'm a physical therapist and I have treated adults after the decompression type of surgery. So Dr. Marino told us that uh, the surgery would include taking Zoe's skull, removing the back of it because her skull was too small for her brain and they put a replacement on the back and that would relieve the pressure on her brain. We surgically approach the area of the brain called the occipital region. The positioning is quite important, so we have to have their head 
in a manner that it, it exposes the area we want to operate. After making an incision, we have to remove some of the musculature off the back of the skull and that musculature is, is pushed to the side using retractors. Once the area we want to see is exposed, we then have to remove some bone. So we have to take away the bone, and that procedure is called laminectomy. The area is inspected closely. We've found structures that we've called fibrous bands or extra pieces of scar tissue that also cause compression. Once we have an ample decompression, we place small screws into the back of the skull, very, very tiny screws that are 1.5 millimeter in size and we will put four or five back there as a post and that allows us to secure the mesh or the cranioplasty to the back of the skull. The cranioplasty is made of titanium and bone cement. Titanium provides a substrate for the cement to grab onto. So we'll pre-fashion titanium mesh in there, make it fit just the way we want. Once we're happy with the way it's shaped, we'll impregnate it with bone cement. That bone cement ultimately is the structure that will protect the back of the skull. We then cement it onto the post that we placed into the back of the brain. Those are the small screws. The bone cement sets up and becomes solidified within a few minutes. Patients are typically in the hospital four or five days. Just in the way human patients recover from a brain surgery and go into critical care, we have our own surgical intensive care unit. And we have a board certified critical care specialist that oversees that area, that department of the hospital. So all of our brain patients will recover in critical care where they're monitored quite closely. We have blood pressure needs to tend to. We have to monitor their blood counts and of course their pain management, keep them comfortable. So the critical care nurses and doctors are in there 24 hours a day to address the patient's needs. They can't tell us how they feel. We have to interpret their behaviors. So when pets come to us with a, a solemn face, a head that's held low and extended, Certainly by the three or four month recheck, the vast majority of patients look normal. In fact, the biggest problem we have three or four months out is holding them back and keeping them quiet. They want to do too much. After the surgery, her prognosis is great. The success rate of the surgery is great, and since she's pretty much symptom free or only four months out of surgery, that leads her to be well off for the future. Chiari malformation uh, came to us. I don't think we came to it. Uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be working in the area of brain surgery for many years. Um, Dorothy uh, Poppy had a pet that she uh, owned and, and found it having some neurologic problems and through some consultations through her work with the Chiari, uh, Chiari malformation, the disease itself, she stumbled upon my name as someone who does a lot of work with veterinary brain surgery. When we first met Dorothy, she was working uh, closely with the Chiari Institute on Long Island. And oddly enough, it's very close by, maybe 15 minutes away. And this is a disease that was unrecognized in veterinary medicine. So when she came to us with a story of, I may have a dog that has Chiari malformation, at first we commented that dogs don't get that disease, but we'll certainly look into it. Um, she did share with us that her son had Chiari malformation and had underwent the procedure, so it was an odd set of coincidence that we all came together in one spot, but very fortunate that was over seven years ago, closer to eight years ago, and it's been nonstop since. And one of the big things I learned is that we can all learn together. Having attended several human conferences at this point, it becomes a sharing of information. I thought I was on just the receiving end, but there actually are things that we've learned that are going on in dogs uh, that have represented terrific models for what goes on in kids. Uh, that's evidence in the work that we're doing right now. We have several collaborative studies with, with biomedical engineers, uh, with human neuroradiologists, uh, with Philips, the folks that provided the MRI technology to us. Everyone's in this together to benefit both human and veterinary patients. One good thing that I think could come from this is that in the future that they could take the research and the knowledge that they're using with these animals and put it towards children and hopefully one day find a solution and a cure so that they can relieve their suffering as much as they've relieved Zoe's.